Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 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 man. Woo. Yeah. Man, it feels good to be home. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You can take your seats. Thank you all so much. You know, I get to speak, um, I get to speak all over the world, and, you know, it's always an honor and a privilege, you know, and I always tell people, you know, Saban has even brought me down to Alabama a few times, and I told him he's putting my VFL card in jeopardy, right? But it's nothing like being back in Tennessee. You know, the love is different, the energy is different, and it's special. And it's always a privilege and an honor. And so before I get started, I want to make sure I express my gratitude uh, to Pastor Davis and his wife. Uh, thank you all so much for thinking enough of me and providing me with this opportunity. I want to thank Jason. I want to thank Chris. We rode down from the airport together for them taking their time to come and get me also to the Sparta campus. You know, it's a pleasure to be with you guys as well. And as I was standing back in, in the little alleyway here and I was watching that video, man, that video was awesome, right? And I was watching it and I'm like, man, I thank God that's not the other video that ESPN did, right? <laughs> because ESPN did a video and it was pretty cool, right? And I'll never forget, I was home one day in Atlanta with my wife and our two children and we got an eight and a nine year old, 11 months apart, Irish twins, give us a run for our money every day of the week. And I was hanging out and the producer called about the film. And so when I picked up, he said, hey, Ink, what are you up to? I said, man, just hanging out, getting a little family time. He said, I need you to take a seat. I got some news I want to share with you. I sat down, I said, what you got? He said, do you remember the film we did? I said, of course, man, forever indebted to you guys for it. He said, well, it's nominated for Emmy. I said, man, that's pretty cool. I said, give me a second, I want to go in the kitchen, I want to share this with my wife. And so me and my wife, we've been at it since fifth grade, you know, puppy love, the whole nine. So I go in the kitchen and I say to my wife, I said, babe, you're not going to believe it, the film with ESPN is nominated for Emmy. And my wife was like, whatever. And I was like, no love? <laughs> right? And she was like, I don't care about sports, right? And so I'm super competitive. And so I walk back into the other room with my kids and I say to the producer, man, who are we up against, right? I wanna win this, I wanna bring it back home to my wife, even though she doesn't care, right? <laughs> to my mother, my grandma, like I wanna win this. And the first name he says was, Ink, there's a film about Muhammad Ali. I said, we lost. <laughs> I said, we lost, right? And we ended up losing, but I got nominated, so it's all good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm a guy, I appreciate every facet, every phase, what some may consider to be success, failure, opposition, ups, downs. I appreciate every facet of life and I firmly believe that life is the greatest classroom, right? And when I encounter situations, my perspective goes to a place of, okay, life, what are you trying to teach me right now? But it wasn't always in that space until the year of 2006 when I was at the University of Tennessee pursuing this dream to go to the NFL, which I soon find out it didn't just stand for National Football League, it also stood for not for long. But when I was pursuing this dream to happen and manifest, in one moment I lost everything I had been working for my whole life. And the next day when I woke up, my life has never been the same ever again. Right, and so when it happened, not only did it alter my life, God stepped in, used the situation to alter my perspective. And so I look at people, situations, places, and things, I view it differently, right? And so I landed in Seattle a couple of months ago around midnight, right? An amazing thing happened. I land in Seattle, a gentleman picks me up from the airport, and we ride to my hotel, and when I get out of the car, I say to the gentleman, man, thanks a lot, I greatly appreciate it. And he says to me, no problem. I just want to let you know, I'll be the guy that's coming back to pick you up in the morning. I said, okay, great. What time would you like for me to be down? He says, 7.15. I said, great, I'll see you then. 
The next morning I come down, we greet each other, we get in the car, we're riding to the venue that I'm scheduled to speak, and maybe five minutes into the trip, I look up and I look in the mirror and the gentleman is crying his eyes out. And I say to him, sir, is everything okay? And he responds, I want to paint a picture for you. He said, my normal job is not in transportation, I'm not a driver. He said, my buddy owns the company. He said, whenever he gets overwhelmed with shifts, he'll call me and say, hey man, can you cover a shift? And usually I'll do it because we do a lot of work with the Seattle Seahawks, and so when I drop a guy off, I'll go on the computer, look him up, pretty cool experience. He said, so naturally when I dropped you off last night, I went on the computer at my house, I started to look you up, and he said, I saw a video about redirection, and I saw a video about perspective. And he said, the reason I'm crying is because I just lost my wife, my wife just died. He said, and I've been living my life thinking, surely there's nothing else that can bring me the passion, the energy, the fuel, the driving force that my wife once brought me. Surely there's nothing else as purposeful as my wife to make me get up and give everything I got to everything I'm a part of. And he said, when I saw the video, it's not that it could replace my wife because nothing could ever replace my wife. He said, but when I saw the video, the amazing thing it did was it altered my perspective and it gave me a new sense of energy. I I said, great. I said, man, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, you said you had two kids, right? He said, yep. I said, okay, cool. Could you tell me at a basic level, in the midst of the opposition, how did you get up every single day, put one foot in front of the other, go out of the door, carry on in your career, and raise your other two children in the midst of the adversity? Can you tell me when you took the blow, you had to absorb the blow, how did you get up every single day and still look at life with some sort of energy and do what you had to do? Right, because the quote says it. You judge the character of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the character of a person by where they stand in times of challenges and controversy. Mike Tyson said it best. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Like everybody is on fire for the Lord until opposition happens. Or when the situation or the circumstances change and they don't get what they expected to get. And so I wanted to understand in the midst of the opposition, how did you get up and how did you carry on and stay committed to your family and to your career? And he said to me, I have to be honest with you. Follow me. He said, my wife had been sick for 30 years. He said she was wheelchair bound. He said, the situation in our household had gotten so toxic that every single day we would get up and when we would meet each other in the living room, we would just bicker, argue, fuss, say certain things to each other to the point to where I couldn't take it anymore and I called one of my buddies and said, I'm leaving. Can I come and stay with you? He said, sure, man, come on. He said, I left. I packed a little night bag. I get to my buddy's house, I get up the next morning, I'm in the mirror, and I'm brushing my teeth, and as I'm brushing my teeth, he said he's saying to himself, for rich or for poor, yeah, we've been pretty poor. For better or for worse, yeah, things have gotten pretty worse. Through sickness and health. And he stopped, put his toothbrush in his bag, zipped it up, and he said when he looked in the mirror, the conviction said to him, you didn't finish. So you didn't do what you said you were going to do. You didn't stand in the pocket how you said you were going to stand it. You didn't be the man that you told her you were going to be. You were all good when it was all good, but when things started to go south, you weren't the man that you said you were going to. You didn't fulfill your promise. And he said the conviction took him right back to his home, and when he walked in the door at his home, his wife was sitting there in a the wheelchair, and as soon as he walked through the door, she said, what are you doing here? And he said, she started giving it to him. And he said to her, I deserve it. Get it out. Say everything you got to say to me. And he said, when she finished, he told her, I just want you to know I'm never leaving again. I'll never go anywhere. Right? No matter how tough it gets, no matter how rough it gets, no matter how bad it gets, I just want you to know I'm going to stand in the pocket and I'm going to be here as your husband. I said, can I ask you another question? He said, sure. I said, if you can go back, shift the situation, change anything about it, what would you do differently? He said, it's easy. He said, I would have shifted my perspective and I would have embraced the opposition a lot earlier. He said, because the moment my perspective shifted, not only did my disposition switch, it shifted my whole household. 
He said, the funny thing is, because of our perspective, we didn't view the opposition as opposition anymore. We started to view the opposition in adversity as an opportunity. I said, bingo. I said, because I'm a firm believer that perspective drives performance every day of the week. How an individual view what they do will always affect how they do what they do. Right? The amazing thing about it is, I love the game of football. Right? I loved everything about it. I was a part of something to where I can inflict violence and not get in trouble for it. Sign me up every day of the week. <laughs> right? I loved every bit of it. But I understood very early that the game of football was kind of like this stage. It was a platform that God had provided for me to cultivate a certain level of excellence and greatness so that one day when I could no longer play the game, it was certain things I could extract from it to apply to other areas and aspects of my life to make me somewhat of a decent human being. And so the most amazing thing about it was I had a coach, I was just texting him backstage, he changed my life. Right, when I was coming up inner city Atlanta, born to my mother at 16, in a two-bedroom home with 14 people. And I had this dream to go to the NFL, but I didn't have the resources, and I was stuck playing tackle football in the street. And I saw a guy that paid for not only me and my three cousins, he paid for kids all across Atlanta, and he didn't want anything in return. And one day when I got the opportunity to ask him a question because he had to drop me off at home after practice, and my mother was working a double shift at Wendy's. And I'll never forget, I got out of his truck, and my house was 125 Warren Street at the time. And when I got out, I said, Coach, man, I really appreciate it. He said, all right, Inc., I'll see you tomorrow. I said, can I ask you something? He said, sure. I said, why do you do what you do? And he opened his door, got, her, got out of his truck, walked around, stood directly in front of me, and I'll never forget, he said to me, son, I'm going to share something with you, and I don't want you to ever forget it. He said, as long as you can make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, son, God will always make sure that your life is okay. And he got in his truck and he left. And so it was hard for me to understand when we played the game of football, how could an individual be a part of an institution and not give everything they had to it if they were doing it for the glory of God? It was hard for me to understand how, if a person had somebody that they loved and they cared about, how could they not push them to get the best out of them if they were doing it for the glory of God and they viewed it in a certain light. And so when I got to the University of Tennessee, I'm gonna be honest, it was Mayberry for me. I was like, man, y'all get smoothies. <laughs> like you get steak, shrimp, and spaghetti. Like guys today are spoiled, right? They got their own barbershop. Right? They got AC in their lockers. Right? They got nap pods. Pods where they could be walking and stop and take a nap. Pods. Nap pods. Na Listen to me for a moment. Nap pods. Where they could just be walking and it's like a nap pod. You're tired? You could go take a nap. Nap pods. It blows my mind. Right? And I had two meetings, and in these two meetings, the job of the meetings was to get a sense of direction of what I wanted to accomplish. And so in one meeting, I said, okay, I want to graduate in three years, and I want to go to the NFL. They said, well, Inky, you didn't just knock out your testing. I said, I get that, but I really want to help my family. And we had a scrimmage, and I'll never forget our first scrimmage, and I was so excited, I was so hyped. I'm an undersized guy. I'm passionate about the game. I want to give everything I got to it. I have a great scrimmage. Right? I'm talking trash. I was a big trash talker. Right? Clean trash, but I was a big trash talker. <laughs> and our chaplain, who now works with the Tennessee Titans, James Mitchell, was present. And when we broke it down and we were walking off the field and I was carrying my pads, and he said, hey, come here. And I jogged over to him and said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, I want you to meet me in my office in the morning. You, you talking a little crazy. I said, all right, cool. And the next morning, I go to see him, and I sit down in his office. I say, hey, man, Mitch, how you doing? Like, hey, man, I'm great. I said, what's up, man? What's the meeting about? He said, I want to disciple you. I said, what is that? I said, that sounds hard. <laughs> he said, yeah, I want to disciple you, like spiritually. I want to go deep with you. I want to help you develop. He said, like, when you have meetings with football, like position meetings, 
I want you to meet with me prior to the meeting, and I want to be able to give you homework, and I want to make you sacrifice and abstain for certain things. I want to help you develop spiritually. That's what discipleship is. I want to go deeper with you. I said, okay, can you give me a second? I want to go talk to my roommates and see, can they do this with me and walk with me because I want a certain level of accountability. He said, yeah, go talk to them. I go talk to my roommates at the time. It was Gerard Mayo. Went first round, 10 pick to the Patriots. Now he's the Patriots linebacker coach. It was Robert Ayers. He went first round, 18 pick to the Denver Broncos. It was Ramon Foster. He's starting for the Pittsburgh Steelers still until his day, and he went free agent. He's been starting for him ever since he got in the league. And I went to him, and I said, hey, man, here's the deal. He wants to walk with us spiritually. Are you guys down? He was like, yeah, let's do it. I said, I get it. We want to be great athletes, but I think we want to be well-rounded as men as well. And this could be really beneficial, and we can hold each other accountable. When one guy gets weak, another guy can step up and help him out. Can we do this? He was like, yeah, let's do it. Right? In the first meeting, we tried him just to see how serious he was. He gave us some homework. We showed up to the meeting. None of us did the homework. He had us look up some scripture. We walk in, and we sit down. He was like, you got your work? We were like, nope. He was like, get out. He's like, come on, man, like, let's go through the lesson. He's like, no, get out. And when we walked out, I'll never forget, Mayo said, oh, he wasn't playing. I was like, no, he's not playing. <laughs> right? And the next meeting, we showed up, and we had everything. We would be in the complex at 4.30 in the morning, going over scripture. We'd be in the complex at 4.30 in the morning with our Bibles open, and Mitch was challenging us. We'd be in the 4.30 in the morning, and he was talking to us about abstaining from sex. We'd be there at 4.30 in the morning. He would be talking to us about different challenges and how to lead our teammates, right? And so in 2006, when my injury happened, a lot of people looked at my response, and they thought it was something to be admired, Right? But when I looked at the situation, the beauty of it, at a certain point in my life, I was like, God, what is this? Right? At one point, the puzzle started to make sense. Man, it looks as if I'm going to be a first-round draft pick. At cornerback, I'm calling my mother, hey, mom, I'm going to the NFL. We'll never struggle again. And then I get on the other side of the injury, and it looks as if, like, God, what's up? It was as if God was saying, trust me, I got you. And I was like, I get that, God, but let me get the contract, and then I'll trust you. And God was like, no, I got something sweeter for you. It might be a little hard. It might take a little bit longer, but I just need you to trust me. And I'm like, I get that part, but my mother's working at Wendy's. I really want to help my mother. I got a little sister. She's here today. She goes to Tennessee State. Like, I really want to help my mother and my little sister. God was like, no, I got you. And so now when I look at it, I'm like, man, I'm so foolish. Like, God had it planned all along. As soon as I hit campus, God was like, let me get him in discipleship. Let me start preparing him for the battle before the battle even happens. Let me put victory in his spirit and in his mindset so when the injury happened, his perspective is already shifting. Let me get him prepared for it so when it happens, he can step back and see the bigger picture. And so the beauty of it was when Coach Foreman came to see me in the hospital, and I love it, Coach Foreman came to see me, and he shook my hand. He said to me, Ink, how you doing? I said, Coach, I'm blessed. He said, you sure, buddy? I was like, yeah, I'm good. I was like, I gave everything. I'm good. He was like, you sure? I was like, yeah, Coach, I'm good. And he walked out, and I could tell he was trying to figure it out. Like, man, why did he say that? And the beauty of it was when it happened, automatically something popped in my head that said, Inky, remember James chapter 1 when it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and perseverance must finish this race so that you may be complete and lacking nothing. So in other words, you got to go through something in order to turn into the individual that God wants you to become. And I used to share with people all the time, I said, man, it's cute to quote scripture, but it's another thing when life puts you in a situation and you got to live it. Yeah. And I noticed immediately God at work. Immediately. Because I was in a room with my mother and my father, and my whole life my mother had despised my father. Because my father left her when she was 16, she had me. And so I was this all-star athlete, and my mother and my father couldn't even be in the same room. And for the first time in their life, they had to be in the same room without the foolishness, 
without worrying about what the next person is going to think. They're in a room because they're not realizing or they don't know what's about to transpire and they don't know if their son is going to live or die. They don't know if he's going to get his arm amputated. They don't know anything. And my mother is sitting there and she's crying. And my father is lying on the floor and his back is to, on the floor and his head is to the ceiling. And out of my father's mouth were the words, Ruby, I'm sorry. He said, you did a great job raising that boy. And I was like, God, I don't know what this is, but I know that's you. <laughs> uh, I was like, <laughs> because you got to feel me. Every time they were around each other, it was like a rock wilder and a chihuahua, and my mother was a rock wilder, right? <laughs> and so when it happened, immediately, I knew it was God. Immediately. I didn't know what was about to happen, but I knew God was in the midst of the situation immediately, and the only thing I was trying to do was stay out of God's way and navigate the situation. I knew immediately when my teammates came to see me, it was an opportunity to witness, and they were going to look at me and see how is it going to respond in this situation. I knew immediately if I responded in the right way, Romans 8.28 could be in full effect, and we know that all things work to the good of those who love the Lord, who are called according to his will and his purpose. I knew immediately. And my father said to me, because the million dollar question I always get everywhere that I go, people say to me, Inky, come on, man, tell me, you, you'll change what happened to you, right? Because I always say, man, I wouldn't change what happened to me for the world. I always say, this is the third best thing that's ever happened to me outside of marrying my wife and having my two children. And people would pull me off to the side in the back and say, Ink, tell me, keep it real with me. You would change it, right? Like, you got paralyzed right on my hand, man. People pull me off, ink, be real, man. If you could be in the NFL right now, making millions of dollars, you'll change that, right? And I'm like, no. I wouldn't change what happened to me for nothing. Let me tell you why. When my injury happened, my father said to me in the hospital, Inky, um, I'm going to come and stay with you for the next 30 days. He said, I'm going to just help you. Whatever you need help with, man, washing clothes, whatever you need, I'm going to help you. Now, my father had never spoken like this, had never did anything like this. And I'll never forget, my father said something to the extent one day of, and how could this God um, let this happen to you? Like, my father wasn't a believer like that his whole life. He's like, Ink, I, I see you go to church and... You give glory to God. Like, how could this God let this happen to you, man? Like, I see you go to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Like, how could this God, like, let this happen to you, man? I call you on Saturday night, see if you're out at a bar, and you tell me you're in with your roommates and y'all doing some stuff for discipleship. Like, how could this God let this happen to you, man? Like, how could this God let this happen? And I'm like, man, God about to spank him. But I knew the 30 days that my father wanted to come stay with me, as bad as it may sound, it wasn't so much about my father coming and assisting, even though I know he wanted to assist, as much as it was about my father coming to say, let me see how he responds now. Like, I'm on the fence with my faith. My father at the time, I'm on the fence with my faith. People are talking about this God thing. I'm trying to figure it out. I really can't comprehend it. I see bad things happening to people that I consider to be good people. So let me try to figure it out. It's somebody I love, somebody I respect. Now they're going through an extreme level of opposition, and they've lost the thing that we both place our identity in. And so, yeah, I want to help him, but I really want to see how he's going to respond to the opposition. And he says he's a believer. Now I want to see if he's still going to pray at night. Now I want to see if he's still going to say, glory to God. Now I want to see if he's still going to say, hey, man, can you tell me, take me to Fellowship of Christian Athletes? I knew it. And my father would take me to Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He would drop me off, and he would say, I'll wait out here. Ink, I'll be waiting on you. He would take me to church, say, hey, Ink, I'll be waiting on you. He would go to rehab. When I would go to rehab, he would lay down on the table, and they would be putting heat packs on his back. And they would put the heat pack on, put the heat pack on, and I'll never forget one day we're in the training room, and they're putting so many heat packs on his back that when they pull the heat packs up, his back was completely raw. 
because he was carrying a burden that wasn't his to carry in the first place. He was trying to carry opposition that wasn't his to carry in the first place, but because he had no connection, it's like Wi-Fi. He couldn't connect, so he didn't have anybody to give it to, and his ego was in full effect, edging God out. His ego was in full effect, and it was breaking him. Every single day, he went from 6'3", 250, to every single day his back got lower and lower. And every single night, the routine was the same. I would get on my knees, I would pray at the same time. And my father would get up and he would walk by Ramon Foster's room, 6'7", 375. And he would say, hey, big boy, you good? Ramon would say, I'm good, pops. He would walk by my room, he would say, ain't you good? I would say, yes, sir, I'm good. He said, all right, good night. Every single night, on the 29th day, my number was 29. My favorite Bible verse is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. On the 29th day, the day before my father was scheduled to leave, I hear my father, hey, big boy, you good? Ramon says, I'm good, pops. He walks by my room. I'm on my knees on the side of my bed getting ready to pray. I said, ain't you good? I said, yes, sir. I'm good. He goes to walk off, and he comes back. He steps in. He says, hey, Ink. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that, uh, that God you pray to? I said, yep. So you know that God you go to uh, discipleship, FCA about? I said, yes, sir. But you know that God I take you to church about? I said, yep. He said, if that God can help you handle this situation the way you're handling it. He says, son, I want to give my life to Christ. Yeah. And not only did my father get saved and corrected his household, he had a wife and he had two daughters. And so when a person says to me, NFL or my father's salvation, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to choose my father's salvation. When somebody say to me, NFL or my teammate's salvation, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to choose my teammate's salvation. Like, I wasn't a great teammate. Hear me, young people that play sports. I wasn't a great teammate because of my athletic ability. I was a great teammate because I pushed my teammates in every aspect of their life. I didn't want us to just be great football players because I understood who we were as people was far more valuable than who we were as football players. I understood at one point it was going to have to end whether we wanted it to or not, and we had to have an identity of something that was a lot greater than sports, right? Like, I went through it for real. Like, this is not lip service. Like, I was in a hospital with six cuts down my left thigh, one cut across the left side of my neck, one across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body. Saturday night, I was running a 4.3840. Sunday morning, I was grabbing my father's shoulder, and I was trying to learn how to walk again, walking laps around UT Medical's hospital. I was bench pressing 350 pounds to Sunday morning waking up and I couldn't feel my arm and I would go to sleep early every single day because I thought it was a bad dream. Until they told me, son, you gotta break your plexus avulsion and you ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest and we gotta take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life or you won't be here in the morning. And they came to me and said, Inky, if we could just get you to assisted daily living. I said, what is that? They said, if we could just get you to the point to where you can get a grocery bag when you're with your wife and you can tuck the grocery bag under your arm, that'll be a win for us. They said, if we could just get you to a point that you can grab a pen or a pencil and you could just put your hand on it and write like a kid, that'll be a plus for us. They said, so here's the catch. We can put you in a two-year process from Knoxville to the Mayo Clinic, and we'll order you every piece of equipment on the face of this planet for your arm. Said, they're the best doctors in the world, right? I said, what's the catch? They said, the catch is this, Inky. We can't guarantee you after the two years that your arm will work. We can't guarantee you after the two years that your fingers will flex. 
We can't guarantee you after the two years that you will have filling in your back, in your arm, in your shoulder. We can't guarantee any of that. It's a brachial plexus. Nobody knows what's about to happen. They said, go to 10 people that you value and you respect and ask them their advice. I went to 10 people. I said, listen, man, here's the situation. What do you think? All 10 told me, Inky, don't do it. And I understood it. They cared about me. They loved me. I said, why? They said, they can't guarantee you that your arm will work. Why will you go through that? They said, they can't guarantee you all of this equipment is going to help you. Why would you go through that? And I remember responding to them in the fact of, man, I thought courage was the ability to start something without any guarantee of success. I thought courage was the ability to embrace a process and eliminate the reward. I said, so I get that, but I'm going to do it. And I started down the path to do it, and I'm an energetic guy. I'm a passionate guy, right? And so one day they would have an arm skateboard for me. I would get on the arm skateboard, do the exercises. I would jump up off the table, go to the PT, and I would say, J.D., what you got for me, man? And he would say, ain't come back tomorrow. The next day, they will have some contraption, some type of balloon contraption. I'll get on it. I'll do it. I'll get up off the table. J.D., what you got for me, man? Come back tomorrow. It's almost two years. Until one day, I get up off the table. After exercise, I go over to J.D., and I say, J.D., what you got for me, man? And J.D. walks off. And I jog over to him, and I remember grabbing his shoulder, and I started to turn him around. And when he turned around, he was crying. And he said to me, Ink, I'm sorry to tell you, but you will probably never be able to use that arm and that hand another day for the rest of your life. And I said to him, physically. He said, what do you mean, physically? I said, physically, my right hook is out of commission. I said, physically, J.D., um, I can't do some of the things I want to do. You know what the coolest thing in the world to me was? When I was a kid, it wasn't an interception. I used to go across the track in my neighborhood, and there was a swimming pool, right? And I used to go by the swimming pool, and I would stand on the fence, and I would see a father, and when he would grab a kid, whether it was his son or his daughter, and he would throw the kid up in the air, and he would catch him, and the kid would laugh, and I would be like, man, I can't wait until I get a family one day so I could throw my kids up and catch them in the pool, right? I can't wait until I can hug my mother with two arms, hug my wife, hug my three little sisters with two arms, and it's things that people take for granted every single day. And so when I said to him physically, I'm like, J.D., all of those things are eliminated. I said, but I will use this arm in his hand every day of my life for the rest of my life because I will never allow a situation or circumstance to define my life. I said, J.D., what better way for God to show up than in the midst of the opposition? What better way for God to prove his power and his grace than in the midst of the adversity? I said, J.D., what better way for God to work in the lives of those I'm connected to than in the midst of the opposition? The only thing I've ever done was stay out of God's way and say, God, you're going in that direction? Okay, cool, let's rock. God, you want to do this with my life? Cool, let's rock. I never wanted to speak. They put me in public speaking in college. I dropped the class on the second day. I despised it. As I was walking out of the class, I said to my buddy, I was like, man, I'll never be needing that. And the coach was on the other side of me, and he said, Inky, you never know. Until the point of complete confusion. Because as people, what do we try to do? We try to control, like in, in, in certain areas of life, they'll call it controlling the narrative. Right, when you try to jump out in front of situations, opposition, trouble, and you try to control it. Like if we walked out of this building right now, and we walked down to the high school with 10 people, and we said, okay, when we get to the high school, I want five people to go right, I want five people to go left. Everybody would probably turn around and say, why? Why do you want me to go left? Why? Why should I trust you to walk down to the high school? We want to control the narrative. We want to know what's next. And so when my injury happened, I'm still trying to control my life. And I said, okay, I'll become a coach. I'll coach. Football, natural transition. I start down the path to become a coach. Three years in, graduate assistant. My wife is back in Atlanta teaching. She calls me one day, and she says, Inky, I'm pregnant. Somehow I got pregnant. I don't know. Somehow it happened. And I go to Coach Fulham. I said, listen, here's the deal. My wife is pregnant. I really need to go back. He said, man, go be, for, go, go be there for your family. 
and I call a guy trying to control the narrative. Me and Pastor was talking about this. He said, God cannot work and God cannot take you where he wants to take you until you allow God to take you where he wants to take you. And most of the time when that happens, it's when you say, I yield, I yield, because you're in such a place of confusion in your life and you can no longer control it. And so it places you in a position to where it has to fortify your faith. And so I called the guy and I said, man, listen, I'm coming to Atlanta. I really need a job. And he worked at the rec center. And he said to me, Inky, you can come, man. You can create curriculums for the kids. I'll pay you 21, 20,000 a year, whatever. And you can just ride it off into the sunset. I said, praise God, I'm coming. And I get there the next day and I go up to the gymnasium. I call the guy, he never responds. I email him, never responds. The people there, I give them my resume, my paperwork, and they say to me, oh, you're overqualified. I said, what is that? They say, yeah, you can't work here. And I found myself in my wife's grandmother's home. My wife had our daughter, Jada. Jada sleeping in a wagon that somebody bought her for her birthday, and we would put pillows in the wagon. And I'm two blocks away from where I grew up in that two-bedroom home with 14 people. And I'm like, God... Why did you take me from this neighborhood to the University of Tennessee, play football, get 10 games from the NFL, and bring me right back to the same neighborhood in my wife's grandmother's home with my daughter sleeping in a wagon and no money? And I would get up every single day. My wife would get dressed to go teach. I would get dressed, and I would go look for a job. People would say, you're overqualified. And I knew most of the people were saying this because I got a disability. We're looking at it in terms of, man, I don't know what I can do with this guy. And I was cool with it. I totally understood it. And at the time, the only thing I had was my book. And I had written my book as a journaling process to help me get through my injury. And so I would just journal. I put it in book form. And I really just wanted to give it to my grandmother. And one morning, I get up with my wife, and we're getting dressed, and she's in the mirror. And I'm standing there beside her. And I say to my wife, babe, you're not going to believe it. She said, what you got, eh? I said, I'm headed to Chicago. I'm about to go meet Oprah and give her my book. And my wife looked at me. She said, ain't you know Oprah? <laughs> I said, nope. She said, oh, you know anybody at Harpo Studios? I was like, nope. She said, you sure? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, go for it. I had a 2X suit. I had a little bit over $200 to my name and I had my truck. I went, I jumped in my truck, I'm praying, I'm like, Lord, please don't let me catch a flat. I catch a flat, it's over with. And I start driving and I get to Chattanooga. And I call my buddy Jeff, that's in Knoxville. Jeff picks up, Jeff's an attorney, he's well off, right, he's my buddy. I call him, Jeff picks up and says, Ink, what's up? I said, Jeff, you're not gonna believe it. He said, what you got, Ink? I said, man, I'm headed to Chicago to meet Oprah. I'm about to give it a book. Jeff says, oh, ain't you know Oprah? <laughs> I said, no. He said, oh, I get it, I get it. Ink, I understand you're a highly ambitious person, but I need you to hang this phone up and call me back when you get to Knoxville. Chances of that happening are slim to none. I call Jeff when I get to Knoxville. Jeff picks up. He says, you're still going, aren't you? I said, yep. He says, stop by and pick me up. I'm going to ride with you because I don't want you to be too disappointed when it doesn't happen. I pick Jeff up, we get to Chicago that night. Jeff goes up, Jeff gets us a room. Next morning we get up, I go to the front desk, I'm asking for directions. Jeff is standing in the corner getting ready to go work out. I get directions, I'm going to walk out of the building. Jeff jogs over, he says, Ink, wait. He said, I'm gonna go with you, man. I'm gonna get us a taxi. I don't want you to be too disappointed when it doesn't happen. We pull up to Harpo Studios in the taxi, place is massive. People everywhere. It's when our last shows were happening. We get out of the car. Jeff says to me, hey, Ink, I'm going across the street to this coffee shop. I'm sure this won't be long. I'll see you in a minute. I get the book. I walk around the building. Every door that will open, I will run into the door. And I will say, hey, man, I'm Inky Johnson. I drove up from Atlanta. I want to get open my book. And they would say, get out of here. We don't do that. I said, man, y'all rude. I thought y'all give away cars. Huh? <laughs> I just got a book. And I got so discouraged. I went around the back of the building 
And I sat down in the parking lot and I looked up at the sky and I'm like, God, man, my wife's going to chew me out. And I get up and I go around the side of the building. At this point, everybody has went into the building. And it's one gentleman and he's sitting on the curb and he looks to be a homeless gentleman. And I sit down beside him and I say to him, sir, how are you? He said, man, I'm great. How are you? I said, man, I've seen better days. The irony of the situation. And I look up to my left and when I look up to my left, coming down the sidewalk was Oprah and her security guard. And I stand up and I fix my suit. I say, here goes, right? And I start walking toward her and they're walking toward me and I'm thinking in my mind, surely she's gonna send security up, move me out of the way, but I shot my shot. And as I'm walking, they're continuing to come and she stops dead center in front of me and she grabs my suit and she shakes it. And she says, this is a nice suit. I said, thank you. I know she was shaking it to see if I had a gun or a knife or something, right? <laughs> and I said, I'm Inky Johnson. I drove up from Atlanta. I just wanted to bring you my book. She said, thank you. I said, can I take a picture with you? She said, no problem. We take a picture. She says, all right, I got to get in and do my show. I said, thank you very much. As she was walking in to go in the building, Jeff is running. Jeff says, Ink, tell her to wait. I said, no, oh yeah, little faith, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right. And I go, I go to walk off, and the security guard says to me, hey, hey, little man. And I stop. He said, come here, I want to tell you something. He said, I just want you to know what just happened never happened. He said, usually she'll send me up and say, move them out of the way, you know, tell them to send their book here and they'll never get it. I just want you to know what just transpired, it never happens. I said, man, thank you so much. Right, I walked off, I sent a picture to friends, family. I put it up on social media, right? And everybody's response was, hey, Ink, are you gonna be on the show? Hey, Ink, you're gonna be on the book club? Hey, Ink, you're gonna be on Super Soul? I was like, I don't know, I don't care. They was like, what you mean you don't know, you don't care? I said, that moment wasn't about that. That wasn't a moment about getting on Oprah's show. I said, I got up that morning. I was trying to see, was God still with me? I was trying to see, was God still with the kid that left Atlanta, Georgia, that had this dream to go to the NFL when he was seven and got there at 20 years old? I just need to see. It wasn't about Oprah. I just need to see, God, do I still got the connection? God, do you still hear me? And so when it happened, for me, what happened was, in the midst of the moment, it was confirmation when I was hugging her that God was saying to me, Ink, I got you. I got you, Ink. When I got back to Atlanta, people said, Ink, you need to speak. My simple prayer was this, okay, Lord, I'll be obedient. People are telling me I need to speak. I'll be obedient, send me where you gotta send me. Out of obedience, because in the Bible it says, obedience is better than sacrifice, but you give the average person a task, and what the, what's the first thing they'll do? Judge the level of sacrifice without first being obedient. They'll say, what do I gotta give up? What is it going to cost me? And the first trip I got to speak was a 15-hour round trip to Mississippi, driving. And I get back home at 2 a.m. And my wife is standing there. And when I walk in the door, she's standing there. She said, how was it? I said, babe, it was great. She said, what you get? I said, they gave me this cool coffee mug. <laughs> and she said to me, you sure this is what God called you to do? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, go for it. And I've been doing this for almost 13 years ever since. Right. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. Right, because as much as it is an honor and a privilege for you all, it's an honor and a privilege for me. Every time I walk out on the stage, what the moment means for me is just like when I met Oprah. And I was like, God, you're still with me, man. Every time I walk out on the stage, because I didn't choose this. This chose me. God chose it. God orchestrated and architected it. And so when I meet a person, they're like, man, Ink, I really appreciate your video. I saw the Tennessee video. I'm like, God, you're still with me, man. 
But I see somebody in the airport, they're like, man, can my kid take a picture with you? Can you sign this? I'm like, God, you're still with me, man. And so my question to us is this. Every single day in every aspect of our lives and the things we're privileged to do and the people we're connected to, when the situation or the moment does not go our way, because we all know what to do when it goes right, but when God says no, who will you be? But most importantly, who's watching you and who can be blessed by the opposition, the adversity, and the challenge that you're facing? I firmly believe this wasn't for me. This moment was for my father and the countless others that have came to Christ as a result of it. And every day of the week, thank you. Yeah. Every day of the week, I think we're tasked to make this world a better place, right? In life, people don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. Let's never forget why we exist and why we do what we do every single day. Let's never take this thing for granted and think that alarm clock wakes us up. We know who's the alpha and the omega. Let's represent him bold, courageous, and proud. May you bow your heads and we'll close us out with a prayer. Most incredible, most gracious God, we come to you as a body, humbling ourselves in your presence. Father God, I thank you for every individual in this room. I thank you for their families. I thank you for the things they're connected to. I thank you for the things that you've called them to do. I thank you for the places that they will go in. Father God, I ask that you bless them with an abundance of blessings. Father God, most importantly, may you bless them with the level of peace that surpasses all understanding. Father God, may you bless their spirit, Father God, when things go wrong, Father God. You got some people in this room that's in the midst of adversity right now, that's in a place of confusion right now, Father God. May you comfort them. May you be with them. May you guide them. May you navigate them, Father God. Because we're all aware that you are the only one that can take a mess and turn it into a message. Father God, you're the only one that can take a test and turn it into a testimony. You're the only one that can take a victim and turn them into victory, Father God. Father God, help us to never forget who's in control of every aspect of our lives and never get so arrogant to the point that we allow our emotions to overpower our intelligence, Father God. Let us never forget and find comfort in that Jeremiah 29, 11 when it says, For I know the plans I have for you that clear to the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to harm you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Father God, I thank you with a sincere level of gratitude. I thank you for trusting me. I thank you for speaking through me. I thank you for guiding me. We'd like to ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.